Okay, thank you so much for agreeing to appear on Mediate Jeannie. Uh, today I've got Jeannie Magri with me. She's working uh, really hard extensively in the family law sector, particularly with families that have got uh, really high conflict or complicated issues to resolve. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Welcome. Thank you for having me. As always, good to meet up with you, Joanne. Thank you to everyone else. It's great to have you. I work quite closely with Jeannie um, through the not-for-profit that we run, Interact Support, as often there's a, a need for the services Jeannie provides or back and forward to mediation. But today it's really about finding a bit more about you so do you want to share a little bit why are you doing the sort of work you're doing? And Absolutely. Interesting, this year marks 10 years since we opened up the first practice Power Courage Voice, which was technically only to work just with children. And it was more on a help support basis for parents. However, the market opened up a door and we were seeing more families that were really separated but conflicted around themselves, each other, and given my life experience with my own personal journey starting back, well, nearing now since I entered a courtroom was the first family court hearing was back nearly 26 years ago. And from there, and 10 years this year will also mark, mark 10 years since I've also had my last court hearing in 2014 finalised. And it was actually where my ex-husband was banned from ever applying to the family court. But that took 18 separate applications made by my ex-husband, two from myself, which involved, there were two attempts to remove my son from Australia to Italy. And so that was the first and very last case that I had applied, uh, made an application for. The, the learning curve for that personally was the, the lack of support, the understanding of complex where there's risk matters, there was not enough understanding of what it looked like and there was no fit, there was no components. So they were just slotting me into mainstream and yet the abuse not only became of part of using the system, but then it nearly became part of the practitioners that were fueling the situation that we were in. We moved, my son never had, the, the true story, he never had a bedroom over the his period of his primary school years because we moved nine times. We had to keep moving. We were constantly trying to find a way to feel safe and there was nothing in place. Intervention orders really, they only came out, 14 was the, the time that they really started to pay attention and that was when the how the Howard government came in and it was in, in 2008, there was a change of 50-50. So all of that was still coming, but the protection orders as such was still really not a thing. It wasn't really, no one was paying attention. So the back end of that and seeing then other people have very similar experiences, it alerted me that nothing was changing and I needed to do something and I, and I couldn't just sit down and I wanted to make good of my experience and not feel like the backstory of that would always be just the story. Mm -hmm. And hence moving forward, PTA really it happened on a serviette, by the way, because yeah. the Power Courage Voice started and I knew I needed to do more, just didn't know how to do it. And then suddenly there it was on the back of a serviette and started to mask this reverse engineer the whole planning of what I was trying to achieve. So the introduction of the co-parenting clinic started and that was only our first ever. I didn't think that we would have anything else. And the purpose of clinics was to allow, to see parents separately, work out what the blocks are, start to really understand because we're dealing with humans. Mm. And sometimes it's just one person everyone's upset with, but then what people don't understand, the minute that they're thrown into the family court, you then are deemed with a team of different officers of the court that are coming and working within their frameworks. I needed to break through and find the gaps where no one else could get to in order to prep parents to help them understand and write down to detail of what their presentation was like in court, those that thought they could self-represent, learning that they cannot, or all the things that became 
relatively important to help their path. More importantly, our voice was to be the voice for the children, to help people understand that children need both parents. We just got to work out how that was going to work out. That's, there's so much there. One of the reasons that I'm really happy working with you is sometimes people who have had their own personal experience can tend to see everything through that lens. From your experience, it could be that you see men as the villains, and I know that's not the case. Oh, if anyone could see Jamie, she's there. <laughs> so no, why no. is that? Is that just because I of think the because of the self? First of all, you do have to come to a place of self care, self understanding, and accountability of yourself. What is your contribution? And be honest with you on that. I don't have any hate for my son's father at all. In fact, I have a lot of forgiveness for him because he only could work in the space and react in the space that he understood was entitled to him. And and that, that could be a cultural influence, society, community, family dynamic, historic family behaviors. And so when you have an understanding you're able then to start to look you've got to see beyond that but you, you've got to look at how did I re also react when I look back now I was just afraid of the unknown and I created the unknown as the problem as opposed to what had actually been happening and so moving around maybe did not have to happen as much because the day that I finally had the courage to let him know where we were living because I didn't want Jesse to continue to move from house to house whilst in secondary school and I finally got him admitted into a private school, I then told him and all of a sudden he stopped. As victims also, when we're so traumatised, what we forget is we drag the, the ball and chain with us mm -hmm. and we become so fearful of all the things that may never happen again. And what ends up happening is we repeat those cycles ourselves. We contribute so part of our education with parents is understanding what are those fears? How do we not accelerate them, but walk alongside with them? And how do we start to really get an understanding and, and wrap a level of forgiveness for also for ourselves? Be kind to ourselves, but also remember that our children need a relationship in order to develop well. We see extreme cases from 2010. I did work with high-risk adolescents. I was doing a lot of contact supervision also for high-risk cases where we were, and we're talking about cases that were also unfolding out into the criminal courts as well. Mm -hmm. There are extreme cases that even then the institution is trying to find a way and it, it may be as minimal as once a month supervision for a lifetime of that parent's life or, or parents or the child's life to their 18. So what is that telling us? Children need some level of contact. Mm. And most cases are not at the extreme. Yeah. Most cases are not at the complex. We tend to fuel those. So it's all about the clinic is about when mediation, so we talk about mediation. So mediation at times as you can get stuck. Mm. And so... Either a mediator doesn't have enough experience in the space of understanding what it actually means, what the complexities are, what they're screaming out. And in the, in the past, we've had no choice, issue the 60i and then off they go. And today what we are doing, we're saying, look, you know what, we're going to pause the process. We're going to send you to parenting together apart for parents not together. We want you to book in that co-parenting clinic. You won't be together. I want you to work with that for four weeks and then you're going to come back. So we're pausing the process, putting time on people's side and it's helping them then to have a different perspective when they re-enter into mediation pathway. Mm. The success is it's working. It's been working now for as long as we've been going. And what we're seeing is confidence, parents that have now a different perspective because we're talking children. We're no longer talking the ex. We're talking about the children, what it means. Sometimes we start with a gradual plan that may only need to be two to three years just to help the person that may not be receiving so well in the changes 
So we we give people time, and and that's what people have to understand. Mediators, we have to learn. Nothing has to be rushed. Nothing has to go to court immediately. If we can safely open up a pathway for them to help them to re-enter back with you, what we then have is not the complaint that the mediator didn't know what she was talking about because these are some of the things that we hear. Mm-hmm. Oh, the mediator didn't know. Tell us what that looked like or sounded. Yeah. And normally it's because the parents are still in conflict and they're still really at a place of just hate (laughs) and technically wasn't the mediator and so sometimes as a mediator I think the toughest work and we see it you're solo you're running solo and you need a bit of collaborative support system around you so you're not feeling like you're left to make all of that decision and for those that have been involved with us through the, with all the mediators, we're debriefing, we're really channeling around conversation around, all right, this is now what I have. What's that perspective sound like, feel like? What do you think we need to do? And what that does is it now collaborates for those parents, a, a safe team around them that we can start to work with them and, and start to help and channel back conversation. Lawyers are now involved because lawyers are now, they don't want to deal with all the emotional chaos. They're there to work within, and that's all respect to Paul and and everyone else. What that means is that they just want to say, what are we doing? Matter of fact, and and let's get down to or, or, or across all the T's and crosses. And so what we're doing is we're just filtering all the stuff. We're taking all the conflict. And I guess... My job and our culture is not to be gendered. It's not to be a discriminative because of one's life experience. In fact, um, like yourself, all our network professional partners, our mediators, many have come from a life experience Mm -hmm. and they all bring to the table something that is so valuable. And so what that does is we're learning from each other and we're learning to really understand the hearts of our people. And I have this saying, and I always say, when you're in doubt, even as a professional, talk to the emotional home. Mm-hmm. So really talk to the emotional home because suddenly if you just pause all, all the technicality around all our work and start to really reach to the home of these parents, which is in their hearts, then suddenly what we have is maybe five minutes of just putting some time for them to expel what they feel they need to talk about, you may get something that could turn around and really help you to drive this to a successful mediation pathway. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's a really important point because it, we're not really going to get there if we're being transactional and um, forgetting that these are their kids that they're talking about, the most important um, people in their lives and and there's often a lot of pain associated with having to think about Absolutely. sharing them not having them under your tucked under your wing <laughs> or not having the ability to to show them the things that you want to do I guess that empathy and understanding is really critical but what I'm hearing also from you is the importance of the teamwork of d- different practitioners with different functions and, and roles but communicating, understanding each other and what we do and how we do it so that we can help clients not fall through cracks because <laughs> we know there's, there's definitely Absolutely. cracks in the system. And the reminder is that the minute that an application will be made in court, we are now working with a different space of practitioners that have to be aligned under that space. So this is where the power of parents are. And this is where actually the power of the practitioners are that are working with the parents up until or hopefully to avoid an application made. And with that in mind, it gives us for these parents to understand right now is your power. You're not limited to making decisions. You have the ability now to really work out what that's going to look like or If not, then a decision obviously needs to be practical, that being that it needs to be said that some matters may need to be decided upon in a courtroom. Others may need the experience of what it's like to be in a courtroom. And we see that also where some end up in court finding that all of a sudden they've gone, the brakes are on, and they've realised, if it hasn't gone too far, how they need to 
try to find a way back. Mediators are so important. The, the whole pathway is important, but what mediators need to understand also is that there, there is the, like ourselves, we need to make sure that we're always in a place of impartiality, that we also make sure that we understand the kind of clients we have, that no one's going to judge a mediator if it is too hard or too much or too close to home, that we're able to come together. And because now we're streaming our mediators alongside with Interact Online and, and, and running the whole mediation pathway through us, what's happening is it's creating a, a, a path of teamwork that we're really able then to work with our mediators and, and, and provide that support and network all the way but yes it is I guess some of the issues we see often is the hearts of mediators and at times what we have to learn to do is really value your time but also be mindful that uh, we are remembering impartial not to judge not to assume mm -hmm. and to also be mindful of people do have some tricks up their sleeve in the hope that Maybe if someone, for example, is a perpetrator of domestic violence and is trying to collaborate a team of practitioners in order to sound like the other side is insane mm. or is, is mentally unwell. And so what does that look like? We talk about parental alienation and how often the misinterpretation of victims, the left behind parent, who is so traumatised, that then has a inability over time to dot the reality, so to put reality in its right place. And so then the misinterpretation, so then there's the judgment of oh, that person is mentally unwell, where in turn they may be just so severely traumatised that we see often for parents that have lost children through death, kidnapping, child abduction, mm. child relocation and parental alienation all have the same grievances. And so we need to also be aware, mindful that we may hear a story, but it may only be the perception, mm. not the truth of that story, so that we're not letting that cloud how we navigate through mediation, how we even navigate through our end as well. It's very important to continue to stay focused on the parent, child, parents, so whoever that may be on either side. Mm. And the whatever other concerns are raised, we may review that, observe that, and then that's where the collaboration has become so healthy because we may see something, sometimes we think, mm, am I seeing this? Am I misjudging this? Yeah. And so the wonderful part of conversation is we can have those talks and say, look, this is what's going on or this is what's come up. And sometimes things pop up surprisingly and having that debrief really helps. And this is where we can channel them in and bring them in. And that four-week program we run, for example, really helps us to work out what it actually is because sometimes what may seem like something can actually be completely something else and that person will not disclose it out of fear. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. And really looking, I, I guess, trying to look at what are the behaviours, what are the actual, what's actually happening and what is the impact on the children of, of what's happening um, sometimes can um, help blow away a little bit of the rhetoric and the accusations and the things that are being said, what's actually happening. Absolutely. Um, as much as we're able to. Yeah. to and when everyone's angry at the point of separation, it's just mm. like it's flying ducks are everywhere, you know. And what we try to do is just get everyone to line all the ducks up. You know? <laughs> yeah. And then they're, they're dealing with their group. Or whether we need to start shooting ducks or maybe we can just not, you know. Yeah. I don't know if that's, that's an right. okay example. It's like there, there is so much craziness with separating. There's emotions. It's loss. It's fear. It's all this stuff, just anger mm. raveling around us. Some people want to just get out of it real fast because they already were over it. Others are surprised. And so we have to be sensitive. We, it, I think back in the day where everything was in a box, if you recall, and it mm. just went bang and you were still left dumbfounded, yeah. it's 
so much change now and we really need to know this it has changed so oh, time to be we are we can pause because the courts don't want to see parents the changes came about because they don't want to see parents in court it, it, it backlogged us it was just a crazy time and it's and, and we're still doing catch-up since 2000 end of 2019 but we are the mediator is such an important role and we need to but you're not alone is what we try to say from our end we're here and yeah. we to to help and to work with you and sometimes we may say look this may not be the place and as we mm -hmm. shared we've got the Parental now, since early last year, we launched the Parental Alienation Complex Case Management Services. And so this is the only service under our banner that we only will represent one parent. So this is when we've exhausted every effort to engage the other parent and they've refused. And so now with this wonderful service, it allows us to engage the left behind parent and we're able now to put them onto a journey, an experience where we are actually case managing all the practitioners, prepping them, getting them ready for court, because these are likely matters that will either enter into court, already have started the court process. Mm -hmm. And and so we're, what we're doing, which is unique with these parents, is that we are preparing the parents how to present themselves in front of appointed uh, practitioners uh, during the court process were able to do shadow reporting where possible. So those practitioners we're using, uh, we, we don't disclose them. They're only introduced on a need basis and that's to protect them. And also, so there's no unfold of conflict of interest on the event that we need to utilise their service for court, let's say, mm. if, it, if it continues on. These are the things that we're working with as well. And so that helps. That's another branch for mediators because sometimes we are really, we see it. This is a parent refusing, mm. gatekeeping any chance of that child being any with any relationship with the other parent. So we don't waste time. And what we have found with that particular service now is we are seeing matters as soon as the other side realise that we're on board and that we, we're involved in a different way, but it, now it's up the ante. We're seeing success. We're seeing where some of these parents are going, okay, because we never disclose that a parent may afford or cannot can afford or can not afford to go to court. What we're saying is that this is where it's going. We are trying to do our best to work. We've got family therapists. We've got riders on board with us. And they're all trained in the Bridges program. And so with Dr. Stan Karossi, who's working, who's partnered with me on that project, it's very beneficial. And it, it's, again, another wait for mediators to say, look, let's pause this. Let's get you through this and see what happens. Because sometimes we can then invite the other parent through a family therapeutic pathway mm -hmm. where it's a specialist that's trained in this program for parental alienation. So their approach in terms of how they will work with their parent is going to be specialised around the child withholding behaviours, parental alienation behaviours. Yeah. So all of that becomes, you know, slowly what we're trying to do and what my goal was always to just start to fill up the gaps that the court just can't do because of the way all, all acts are, uh, are designed and have the legislation set up. Where mediators are restricted, where can we come in? Where our lawyers don't want to deal with stuff, where can we come in? And, and that's all we're doing. We're just, I'm just slipping into the gaps. And then these wonderful, I call them these private practitioners like angels that are working on the outside. And Stan is another example of someone who's just, doing exceptional work from life experience that he had to deal with has now turned that around and together we're finding that our strengths are, are much better together and so because that is something that in that field in that space that team are much much more advanced than I am but we can navigate our parents and help them and we, we stay that whole case management pathway we stay for the full conclusion to the case finishes so we're able to case manage and, and work. We brief with the practitioners. We work out whether they need to continue. 
whether we need to introduce something else and we're constant because it's all about what the other side does and yeah. so it dictated by what happens from the other side as well who's involved and, and that, that's the good part yeah, yeah. absolutely and look a, a really I guess a part of why I wanted to talk to you was that often for mediators for family dispute resolution practitioners if we're not really looking at what's the next step for our clients we can sign the section 60i and pretty much dump them with without with a without a hope in some cases and and that can be really quite dangerous I see that and and with the last few months especially we, we've had circumstances where sometimes people get us confused and think that we're someone else mm. and there's an assumption that they thought that because of the referrals are great but if there's no clarity, people assume that we're all running the same. You've got to understand. And I did. When I was a parent, I just thought everyone was from the same place. Yeah. And so people think, oh, but I've just paid you or I've done this. I already did that. And we're not the same. And so then what happens, they lose, they become so disheartened by the system mm. that they give up. Yeah. or they walk away, or at worst, mental health becomes the concern and they become isolated. And it, it, it's we have to understand that this is really trying for a lot of people. And so we have to know we have a duty of care and that duty of care is to really be observant, to make sure that we are, you know, just, you know, making sure that we're caring for people along uh -huh. the way. Absolutely. Because I mean, for a lot of people, their identity is really tightly around being a parent. And so if they uh, don't have the ability to parent, to have any closeness or connection with their child or their child rejects them, as is the case in alienation, can be immensely harmful, like full of shame and absolutely. Yeah, and really cultures, cultures as well. Absolutely. Cultures have a some of them have a very different approach to discipline, have a very different, what may be acceptable for some cultures may be completely contrary in our Western culture. Hmm. I'm saying that I'm Southern Europeans, but the reality is that there are some that don't have the intent to cause harm, don't have the intent to do anything but how they thought they were brought up, what their intent. Is. And my situation was very similar. The, the male was very much always, has always been the dominant for me growing up. I had a, a child who, who was now a male child first. And, and of course, that meant the entitlement. So it wasn't about anything more, but I'm entitled. I'm it. That's my son. And, you know, and so we have to really try to just be mindful about what we're always seeing what we're up against and who we're yeah who, just yeah. who we have in front of us and who do we need who do we need always mm -hmm. be ashamed the collaboration is so powerful and it's actually what it does you know what I love hearing and Joanne and, I, and and this happened you know obviously we had a transfer of clients just not long ago and the client felt so grateful and would not stop talking in how much she just uh, uh, was so grateful to you and how good you were. And in turn, she was thanking me. And so that power in our collaboration just is such a good example of now she is having a few days, but able to have some confidence that now she's got some a support structure around her. And this happens often. We get the good news. We get the people saying, oh, so and so told us to come to you. They're so good. Or and also when there's a few misunderstandings, we're able to say, well, the reason that was suggested or the reason that's come up that way is because we always return clients back to mediators. So one of the big things for us is even if there's sometimes personalities may not match or someone thinks that they're siding with one side or the other. We are always voicing for the for our professionals and always saying, actually, this is what that was about. Mm. And there's no sides. This is and so what it does, we rebuild the confidence, we reinstate yeah. confidence where it needs to be reinstated. Mm. And, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you can also share with the mediators the perceptions that the clients might have not have um, said to the mediators, but and that can be really helpful as well because yeah. 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. We, we all need to keep alert with our practice that we it's not just what's in our mind it's also making sure that that yeah I think one of the things that I talk about a lot with other professionals is we, we have to maintain a level of boundary and and being safe mm. making sure also because it's interesting how many people are doing a lot of information gathering so parents that are searching yes and, and target if they reach out to us first it's usually because they in their minds they have a perception of that we may be in agreement with them all mm. the way through we'll, yeah. we'll indirectly side with them yeah and and then and they can come up they can sip up in many different scenarios it doesn't have to be a phone call or a referral it could be you could be miraculously they some have gone as far as to see where you do coffee or a, a group that you may be part of and they pop up and then they will come up and say, look, I've had a few issues. Can I? I remember years ago, and I, I got caught out and I was, my social life is very private, of course. And then I was popping up and I was on a dance floor and then all of a sudden there's a client. And I'm thinking, okay. Oh. <laughs> so, and the first time I didn't think, then the second time suddenly they popped up in the toilets. And then the third time, and I thought, okay, and, and was in three different places and and I realized what was happening was just friends the social media network everyone's mm -hmm. popping photos checking you in and I thought oh lord so I had to change that quickly and it is a tough role let's face it because we have to keep just it's about being aware and just being alert that people sometimes do have a different narrative and and at times for people to go that far we may also be dealing with someone where a, a a you know mental health may be a component we don't know so yes. we've just got to be always aware and to look after each other and to just be mindful that that boundary of if someone says you may have developed a relationship and then suddenly they say look I need your help it's always look and I've done this out of because we've got good hearts and one of the things I've learned now is just refer yeah, absolutely. because you just don't want to get caught out and because they're you're usually going to be your toughest client anyway mm. oh absolutely yeah if you think that there's any any chance that there's a perception of conflict of interest it's always best to refer absolutely. and if there is like some I'm training a lot of mediators the percentage of them are going to be having issues in their personal life so for me, it's always a matter of referring them. I can have a conversation with them and provide some guidance, but I certainly can't. Importance is so that. important. And look, I've got, I'm probably the worst because I've got such a big heart. And at times friends come up and I don't trust anyone else. And you go, look, okay. But it sometimes can take a, a an experience that can change and you don't want to have that so what you want to do is just go look I'd love to help you and what I'll do I'll be there to support you mm. but I need to really get someone that absolutely. is in the same space that will be able to take care of you absolutely and that I guess that brings us back to the collaboration you talked about as mediators we need to have a really nice network of other mediators that we know and trust and can send our clients to Absolutely. and other services such as yours that we know and trust that we can send clients to when we're not able to assist them or as you say where mm -hmm. things just need to slow down they need to get some more input from other perspectives because at the moment they're a bit blocked by whether it's the emotion or the beliefs that are causing them to make things more difficult than they need to be. I think that's often the case. Don't with be afraid to take time. You're not losing. You're mm. not losing. I, I think what we have to understand about this role, it's about children. Children yeah. are the centrepiece. And therefore, sometimes time can give you more education on the kind of case and matter you have does that make sense so what it, gets about a modification but what then turns out to be what it is yeah. and you may then be dealing with something and god forbid if you, you find yourself in a situation where there is something more serious 
this is the time it gives you, the time you need. Mm. And it's not time for experience. You need experience and experience needs time. Yeah. But you don't have to rush is what we say. And we're here. The wonderful part too is at times I might say to the mediator, I'd like you to come in on the third third session for 15 minutes because then what's happened, there's been a, an awakening with our parent and our parent will say, oh, and I'll say, look, how about if we now bring in, and what that does to it, reseals the relationship, the confidence. We will, because what we then do is we then, we help with this proposed plan that they're now pr propping to each other. And then what we're able to do is say, look, this is what's come up. Now, are you able next week when we'll be on our last? So we get them already booked. So we have this collaboration is key. It, and look at look what's happened for us. I think we've, the girls are just like you you become we've connected and it becomes another channel of family and that's what we encourage for the new mediators we want you to really feel like there is this family that you're entering into and and you run such a excellent training program but also i think the fact that you're not just dumping you you really work with your mediators and you're there for long term and that's what we want for mediators. We really want success. You want to have success is not going to court. Success is being able to work with as many parents as you can to help find a way. But it's also legitimately identifying and qualifying the ones that sometimes say, look, we need to do this 60i, not just because we see too many where they're coming to us and we find that the 60i was just issued. Hmm. And it's just different companies train differently, whereas our goal is to just keep them out of court. Yeah, and look, it's it's really interesting, and I'm just aware of time, we're almost out of it, but yeah. we had Senior Judicial Register, Emery Rice, speaking on a Family Law Day we had very recently, and that was an absolutely critical point that she made about one, the, what you talked about before, about the flexibility that we have in mediation that they actually don't have in the court system. They're, they're very much bound by the legislation, whereas while people are negotiating, they can look at their family, their specific circumstances. But the other thing was around time, that we don't need to rush things in mediation. It doesn't have to be a single session and that's it. You didn't reach an agreement, so off to court. It's not that at all. And the metaphor that she used is like a hurdle race. If you try and put all the hurdles together, no one could possibly jump over them. If you space them out, <laughs> you, you can. And another thing we do also is sometimes when we're involved, what we try to do is also collaborate the team for the family and for the yeah. children. So we actually then get introduced to the school. We will, because one of the voices we have through our co-parenting clinic, have you contacted the school? So many parents don't know or think about letting the school know things mm. have changed. And so what we do is we do a care management team meeting with the school, with all the appropriate people mm. for the children. What that does, we suddenly have another team. Yeah another community a team in the community that are there to support the parents not yeah. singular both parents then what do we want there so the kids can have a go-to so we call it the go-to for children school counselor the chaplain the welfare officer who are the go-to for the children when they're feeling a little bit sad or or worried or or mm -hmm. if there are concerns what it does is it collaborates this conversation and we the lawyers are the same. The lawyers will call up and because for them, they again, they are bound. And so there's only so much that they, they need to, they're waiting for instruction, but they know sometimes the instruction's not very clear or it's not, not going to be at its best. We can come in and conversation with the clients, say, look, why don't we just approach it this way? Or how about if we try on this angle? And slowly, time is definitely, yeah, yeah absolutely. That's a really wonderful. important aspect. So thank you so much, Jeannie. If people are listening, whether they're professionals or parents and would like to get in contact with you, what's the best yeah. way for them to so do Our website for parents, if they want to book a free consultation, we do 30 minutes as for free, just so we get an understanding of what's going on. They can go directly to our website at parentingtogetherapart.com.au and there it has book consultation, I believe, and they can book book a free mm. consultation immediately. 
for practitioners, they can email directly um, at info at parentingtogetherapart.com.au or they can just call, text our number at 0423 299 761 or they can also book a consultation and just send a message that they're a mediator so we know and not a problem. And, and we'll have a chat. We are looking for mediators because what we're doing now is we also want to start, we are referring now mediation as part of our pathway as well. And that way then, so that's something that also can give others another avenue to work with, which is going to be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Starting out and the experience of complex cases. We do all cases, but a lot of high risk and and complex Mm -hmm. matters. That's wonderful, um, Jeannie. I think you've given a lot of food for thought for people and particularly realising that there, there are ways for more support around for families than we can provide in our role as mediators because there are some constraints in what we can do which, yeah, doesn't mean that there are constraints in what can be done with and for parents. So it's a matter of looking at how we can collaborate, how we can learn about other services such as the Pairing Together Apart and the other programs. Absolutely. Thank Thank you so much, Joanne. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.